Hello and welcome. Cloud computing is getting bigger and more pervasive. More and more of our transactions, our lives, are actually sitting on clouds and data centers all over the world, including in India. To find out how deep the cloud computing phenomenon is, is really, I'm joined by Dheeraj Pandey of Nutanix, a data center company, to talk about it. Dheeraj, thank you very much for joining us. So you've been in this uh, business for now seven years and you also have a substantial presence in India. But tell us broadly, how pervasive has cloud computing begun as a general question? Then let me ask you some more specific questions. Well, I think the whole idea of cloud is to, you know, buy as you need it. Mm -hmm. So you're not doing big purchases anymore, which is what enterprises were used to doing for the longest time. So it's very elastic in terms of growing and shrinking your needs, which is exactly what people need, just in time and best fit versus buying something up front. And the second thing about cloud is that it's very simple to use, like, you know, extremely consumer grade. So what Apple did to our lives is what the cloud will do to a lot of people's lives who work in the trenches of a data center and you know do a lot of enterprise computing work. So I think the direction and the virtues of cloud are basically indisputable. You know, so they will happen. People want things to be way, way easier to use and manage, and uh, people also want things to be not over provisioned or over committed for three years if they can actually pay as they grow. So amongst the people you work with, and I know you work with a lot of uh, companies in India, including banks and also government, am I right? Yeah. 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 So y how do, I mean, how is that relationship and what is the uh, you know, specific or uh, the edge that you offer versus, let's say, someone else? I think the big challenge with any of this, you know, as you can think of uh, IT that we already have for the last 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. how do you move it from point A to point B? Like, you know, imagine the Modi government coming and saying we're going to reform everything. But it's a billion point three people. Mm -hmm. So you have this uh, paradox that you basically have to confront. You know, what does it mean to keep the lights on, which is what the present is, and mm -hmm. how do you also reform for the future? Mm -hmm. And uh, IT is basically saddled with that problem. That, you know, they have to keep the lights on. Businesses cannot take a disruptive move to mm -hmm. this new uh, way of doing things. And Nutanix actually provides that dial that says, look, this is the way you should first re-architect in-house. Mm. You know, you should bring all the elements of what public cloud is in-house. And then you should figure out whether you want to own or rent. Because one of the big elements of uh, cloud will be, what do I want to own? Mm. Because I understand my predictable workloads and it's cheaper to own than to rent. I mean, case in point, you know, if uh, I come to Mumbai for three days, I'm going to rent a hotel mm. or I'm going to rent a car. But if I need to stay here for a year or three years, I won't rent a hotel. You know, at least an apartment or for three years I'm gonna buy a house. So the more future visibility I have, I'm gonna use a different consumption model which is owning something, than when I need something bursty, seasonal. You know, that's when I go and rent things. So I think there is a massive opportunity to actually meld these two different consumption models, which are economic decisions, but equally important because it's not like one is better than the other in all circumstances. Mm. So wh what's the kind of uh, opportunity that you see in a market where you've got big players, uh, Amazon being one of them, of course, uh, versus, let's say, uh, players who are established brands. It could be an HP or people who've been in the technology space and someone like you. So how, how does the market distinguish between who's offering what? Mm. Well, uh, the big incumbents, if you keep the public cloud uh, like Amazon aside, the big incumbents tried and failed and they have already retracted. Mm. HP, Cisco, the world, you know, initially they were scoffing at Amazon. How can a book company mm. actually ever deliver computing to enterprises? Mm. Uh, we know this better. And, and they've done this to Apple in the past. If you look at six years ago when Apple said, we're going to bring consumer grade to the enterprise, mm. they all used to laugh at it. An iPhone will never make it to the enterprise because it's not secure, it's built for millennials and this and that. You can play music, but you can't access email securely and so on. So all these big hardware companies, they got into the space of building tablets and phones and such, you know, and then they finally got out because, you know, Apple proved that it could be the easiest to use and you could still be the most secure and so on. You know? So something similar actually happened in the cloud world. You know, they all, all these big hardware companies, they said, look, Amazon can never really touch the enterprise because we have account control. We understand the end user better than anybody else. And all of a sudden, they tried this for two, three years, and then they finally retracted because it is not just about putting some hardware in a data center and therefore that's cloud. Cloud is a way of life where you're putting a lot of e-commerce metaphors into computing. You know, Things like credit cards and payments and identity and surge pricing and all these elements the hardware companies can't even touch. 
So, I mean, I think the incumbents are out. Mm. They'll do a lot of talking. In fact, they've already gotten out of the public cloud story. Now they're onto a new bandwagon called hyperconvergence. Mm. You know, this idea that you can bring the cloud-like architecture to on-prem. Mm. And even there, but they're- you're also playing in the same space. Yeah, except that uh, we in VMware talk software language. We're talking about an operating system. It's an end-to-end -end story of all the way from hypervisor and operating system storage networking to you know systems management. You know, there's a whole uh, working the whole body of the operating system versus the hardware guys going and still talking a language of five years ago. Oh, we can do storage in pure software or something like that. You know? So I think on-prem, it's basically a two-horse race between VMware and Nutanix. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think between on-prem and off-prem, uh, the jury is still out because, uh, like recently, two months ago, VMware and AWS actually came on together. You mean premises? On-prem, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm using a word which is yeah. a little more westernized word. Yeah, so uh, off-prem is where Amazon and, AW, uh, and uh, VMware have come together to say, look, directionally the world needs hybrid. Because you know you can't throw everything you have, uh, and obviously you cover renting. You want to be able to rent some for your burst requirements, your seasonal requirements, and things like that. So the direction is towards hybrid. Mm. The question is: Is it going to be an alliance and business development work where two companies come together, like VMware and Amazon have come, or will it be a computer science problem of saying you know you have this data center and you have the other data center, and you don't own the other one? Mm. How do you meld the two together, which is seamless, you know, where you don't really, just like iCloud and iPhone are one. Like you look at your, uh, you know, personal computing experience, you don't think of iCloud being a separate world from the iPhone. So the device you own and the service you rent are actually together in one. Right. So let me ask a couple of questions about you. So you, you entered this space, you were working in another firm in the Valley, you entered this space. How, how did you decide to take on and enter a space which was in some ways already occupied with, by very big people? How did you spot that entrepreneurial opportunity? Mm. Well, so people use the word red ocean, blue ocean. You know, the red ocean is, is a bloodbath, a ton of sharks, and, uh, but it's a large ocean. Blue ocean is a small ocean, it's not as competitive. But very quickly it peters away because the market is small. Mm. So we happen to be in a red ocean mm. of a lot of incumbents who actually are, you know, creating a ton of noise about Me Too products, ankle biting products, and so on. But the idea here is so it's a double-edged sword. You know, red oceans are big, mm. but you get eaten up if you're not agile and you don't know how to navigate uh, the changing uh, circumstances. So, as a company, we've been probably uh, really honest about the product, really honest about you know, customer support. And if you do a good job of, like a really good job of product and customer support, then you're able to cut through the noise mm. of the red ocean. Mm. You know, uh, because as I said, it's very But noisy. you didn't see this as uh, something insurmountable when you started out? No, I mean, obviously if you started out, you had already decided to, but how, how did you see it when you started out? I mean, you know, uh, when you're growing up, you know, whether it's a country trying to become a bigger country, more mm. powerful country and so on, there's always going to be the incumbents who will try to basically uh, come upon you mm. and say, no, no, I won't let this one grow because it's a share of wallet, you know, it's a share of power or whatever that thing is. So big companies always actually try to, you know, really uh, scare you. Like, oh, you can't do this, you don't have the sales and marketing. At best, you'll have good engineering, but you'll need my entire sales force and my marketing machine to really go do this. Mm. So I think it's a rite of passage to actually have that level of fearlessness you know, that audacity to say, look, I'm not just good at technology, I'm also good at distribution and go to market. And the word is hustling, you know, that I could out hustle you in the market. And I think that's what uh, really builds large companies. Large companies aren't just tech companies, mm -hmm. they're really good at distribution as well, and they're really good at hustling and so on. So I think, uh, you know, we've had to have that audacity of hope to say that we can actually not just build awesome products, but we can also build an awesome distribution. Right, as well. and that's a very well known Barack Obama line as well. So if you were to, you know, if you look at your entrepreneurial journey today, I mean, do you think that it in some ways in, would in, should inspire people to say that, okay, if it's a red ocean, as you say, I should be fearless and go ahead and take, take uh, you know, big bets because no one in his right mind would, let's say, think of starting an e-commerce company today. Mm -hmm. Uh, or maybe even get into the data center or the cloud space today because you look at Amazon and you run in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So is that is that something that you would advise? Yeah, and I think you know different people have different, uh, I would say, appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. uh, I would take the risk in a red ocean mm -hmm. than take a risk in a blue ocean, mm -hmm. which eventually, once it matures, all I can do is sell the business. Mm -hmm. 
The Red Ocean's advantage is that I can get into adjacencies. I mean, this company started out trying to get rid of uh, a $25 billion mm. external storage economics. Mm. It's like this whole industry that sells boxes, mm. which specialized boxes. So we'll get rid of that. But three, four years ago, we said, look, we need to compete with VMware as well. Mm. Because, you know, it's not just getting rid of the box that storage companies have actually built. But there's another line item in people's procurement that is expensive, and in the public cloud, you don't pay for it. Mm. You don't manage it. You don't have people thinking about it all the time. Because that technology is now a means to an end, mm. not an end in itself. Like virtualization was a CIO strategy mm. 10 years ago. Virtualization is now a tuck-in. You know, it should basically not even be charged for it, and you shouldn't have people managing it. So every three, four, five years, you've gotten into adjacencies. And that's the value of the Red Ocean. You know, that it, if you're agile enough to know what your adjacency is, mm. then you can go and build a, a bigger, better offering over time as well. So I would say that you know, it depends on the appetite of risk for people. If, they, if their thing is that you know, it's hard for me to survive, I would rather pick a, an area which is mm. no competition. Mm. But I personally have a cognitive bias mm. a, against those things. Because if, look, if you don't have enough competition, you're the king of the hill. Mm very quickly you'll realize that no one else actually wants that stuff. So where did you, pay, where did you develop that? I think, you know, uh, some of these are innate, mm. you know, obviously uh, subconscious biases that people have. Mm. Uh, I have a subconscious bias that if you do a great job of you, what you are good at, you know, the strength is within. Mm. You don't get cowered down by the noise on the outside. You know? Because the strength is within if you build great products, if you have great employees, happy employees, if you have happy customers, then the word of mouth, because mm. all these customers, they actually hate incumbency anyway. Mm. When you think about it, once you become large mm. as a vendor, customers start to hate you. Mm. Because there's a thing called the paradox of growth. Mm. That the moment you become large, you become complex. Mm. And you know, growth creates that complexity, you know, product complexity, organizational complexity, you know, uh, uh, business complexity, routes to market that are conflicting. So all of a sudden, that complexity kills the growth, which is what incumbencies actually go through. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a great opportunity for us to go and then sit with our customers and customers like, you know what, I want you to win. Mm -hmm. I wanted to win because I hate this relationship I have with the incumbent because they're squeezing me. They don't have great customer support. You know, they've, they used to be awesome, but now they are not. That's the cycle of creative destruction, the ocean of churn mm -hmm. that the Red Ocean actually goes through. And that's an opportunity for companies like us to go and uh, really exploit. Yeah, and that's a wonderful metaphor. Last question. So what's, what's your sense on what's going to happen on the cloud side or the cloud computing side in the coming year or so? The three, three broad trends yeah, that you absolutely. see, which could be, I mean, positive for you, but also maybe areas that you view as concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, so the spend is large. If you think of the $3.6 trillion spend uh, overall in IT every year, about $600 billion is infrastructure, which is a... 215, 220 in capital, which is software and, and uh, hardware, uh, CapEx. And then there is about 400 billion in people costs, like professional services, SIs, employees who actually manage infrastructure. They're going and stitching things for the first time and the nth time, the umpteenth time, and so on. Doing a lot of stuff that's imminently automatable. That's $400 billion. Mm -hmm. The cloud, what it's doing is, obviously it's looking at the CapEx po portion of it and saying we can actually rent this, you don't have to buy this. But it's also squeezing on the 400 billion. Because mm. a lot of these tasks are eminently automatable. Mm. And they're eminently one-clickable, mm. you know, just like you do in e-commerce, right? Mm. And uh, uh, they are also things that machines could learn about, AI, machine learning, where machines fix other machines. Mm. Machines heal other machines, machines heal themselves and so on but you don't need people to come and mediate uh, these uh, you know, tasks. So I think that 400 billion could probably shrink to 300 billion as software comes in. And then the people that exist will be elevated to do bigger, better things. Like, go figure out how to do something more complex than machines can do, mm. that only humans can do. Mm. But don't do things that are now in the realm of the machine itself. You know? So in that sense, it's still a half a trillion dollar market. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think there's opportunity for many companies who actually have the audacity to say, look, if I build awesome products and services, I don't have to worry about these companies that are actually growing. So if you look at Amazon, it was growing at 80% at 8 billion. It was growing at 64% at 10 billion. It's growing at 47% at 14 billion. If you extrapolate by 35 billion, they're a 10% growth company. Then what? That's at 35 billion, they're done, right? Mm. Laws of physics, right? Mm. So if you were to say, look, it's half a trillion dollar market, 
and the largest cloud company, which is the only honest cloud company that doesn't bundle, mm. uh, they can't bundle a mouthwash and a toothpaste with mm. a cloud, right? So they're the only company that actually has true utilization, not shelfware. Mm. Uh, so if that company is basically uh, maxing out at 35 billion, mm. where will the rest of the 450 billion be spent? And that's the opportunity that we are looking at and saying, look, customers have a lot of legacy and while you can show them the future, it's a discontinuous jump. Mm. And they don't know how to go from base camp to Mount Everest. Mm. You know, you're showing the Mount Everest saying, it's the zenith of uh, what you can actually achieve. But how do you go from here to there? You need Sherpas along the way. And that Sherpa is a cloud operating system that we've built that says, look, you go from here to here, you conserve some oxygen, you go and take some rest here and probably camp overnight here, and then you look at the weather and you understand how it's gonna to be tomorrow and so on. That's the journey from base camp, which is the world that we live in, to Mount Everest where you, know, you have this extremely dreamy-eyed view of what cloud actually means to be. Right, and that's the most fitting end to our conversation. Thank you so much, Tiraj. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it.